Welcome everyone. I'm Christina Johnson, president of The Ohio State University. This evening's event is the fourth in a series designed to realize Ohio State's motto, education for citizenship, in light of the January 6th assault on our nation's capital. Tonight, we're focusing on navigating the post-truth world. One of the most disturbing aspects of the Capitol siege was the sincere belief of some, maybe many rioters, that the presidential election had been stolen. They believed this, even though there was no evidence to support such a theory, even though experts at all levels of government assured us that the election was secure. At The Ohio State University, our work is largely, largely about gathering evidence, whether in laboratories, hospitals, libraries, or agricultural fields that will lead us to new truths. It is also creating expertise by educating the leaders of the next generation. So for this community, these indeed are strange times. But for some, the consumption of conspiracy theories has become a kind of addiction. Even realities recognized by an overwhelming consensus of scientists, such as anthropogenic climate change or the need to wear masks to stop the spread of COVID are not accepted by some of our neighbors. 39% of Americans say that they probably or definitely will not get a COVID vaccine. There are a lot of contributors to the state of affairs, including social media whose algorithms ratchet up the extremism of the content they present as a means of keeping people engaged, as well as traditional media and political leaders using the confusion of fact and fiction for their own benefit. One of the most important roles of the federal government is gathering reliable data for the country. Yet we have lived through a period when even data has become politicized. How can we build a happier and more just society and we can't even agree on the basic facts. Fortunately, we have a panel of experts to help us consider ways to restore truth to its rightful place in our, civil dis in our civic discourse. Our moderator this evening is Dr. Nicole Kraft, associate professor and uh, in the um, College of Arts and Sciences and, uh, and in the School of Communications, who's also an award-winning reporter, editor, and magazine journalist. She will be moderating a panel with our experts, Dr. R. Kelly Garrett, professor in our School of Communications and an expert in political uh, misperceptions and the internet. Dr. David Landsbergen, associate professor and graduate studies chair in the John Glenn College of Public Affairs and an expert in information policy and data governance and Mr. Devon Norris, a doctoral candidate in sociology whose research focuses on credit worthiness, algorithm, al algorithmic and predictive scoring and inequality. And now I turn the program over to Dr. Kraft. I'm the first one to be muted. Um, well, thank you so much, Dr. Johnson. It is an absolute privilege to be here with you on a topic that I, I don't think we can stress the importance of enough, especially in the climate that we are currently in. So I am thrilled to welcome you to this conversation among three extraordinary speakers who are going to share a variety of thoughts and, and, and their, the knowledge that they have. But we very much want to hear from you. So this needs to be a conversation, not just among them, but also with you. So please, your questions are not just encouraged, they are needed for us to really dig deep into this topic. And we are very uh, just excited to hear what you have to say and, and to get our speakers engaged on that. Um, so I, one thing that I, I really, uh, this is such a difficult topic to even know where to begin. This word of um, didn't really come into existence until 2016, this idea of post-truth. It was actually named the word of the year by the Oxford English Dictionary at that point. And Kelly, I'm not sure that we even understand what we mean exactly by post-truth. And I was hoping that each one of you, but maybe you could start, Kelly, tell us exactly what we mean by that. Sure, I'm happy to talk about that. And, and let me just echo that I'm like you very interested to hear what members of the audience have to say. This is a topic I've been thinking about for a long time. Uh, it's sort of come into the focus in the last several years and uh, it's, it's important and worth talking a lot about. So you mentioned that uh, this, was, this word was identified as the word of the year back in 2016. And at the time, the editors of the Oxford Dictionaries said this about it, uh, I'm quoting here, post-truth is an adjective defined as relating to or denoting circumstances 
in which objective facts are less influential in shaping public opinion than appeals to emotion or personal belief. Um, so there's a slide in the slide deck. Uh, maybe we can put that up. This will, I think, encapsulate the kinds of things that people think about when they talk about the post-truth reality. That is, we see these dramatically different beliefs among partisans about the reality of the world. This comes from a study that's currently ongoing. We've been collecting data over the last several months. And in these studies, we're in the study, we're, we're asking people about claims that are widely circulating on social media, some true, some false. And it's just amazing how big the opinion gaps are. We have 80% uh, of Democrats believing something that only a third of Republicans say is true. And 50% or 45% of Republicans saying something that only 3% of Democrats believe is true. The gaps are huge. And so the question becomes where, you know, okay, let me, let me say something about this definition. While I think that the uh, naming this as a, a uh, word of the year and bringing attention to the notion that beliefs don't always align with the best available evidence is really an important uh, contribution. But at the same time, the term post-truth implies uh, an assumption that I'm not sure we should accept at face value. The suggestion that, that people have decided that objective facts don't matter as much as how the people feel about reality, that, that seems to imply that um, we just don't care what's true anymore. And I don't think that we have the evidence to support that claim. But don't get me wrong, there are high profile examples of people who explicitly question the value of evidence and of empirical evidence, uh, facts. You know, Kellyanne Conway's infamous statement about Trump supporters having alternative facts, or the fact that a quarter of Republicans believe in QAnon conspiracy theories. These are troubling, but I am not yet convinced that this is because people have given up on or devalue facts or that they've decided that how they feel about reality is more important than what the facts say. So with that, I'll, I'll uh, stop and let my esteemed colleagues weigh in. Well, David, we certainly have a lot of food for thought here so far. Could you kind of help us uh, see this from the, uh, from the Glenn College's perspective? <clears throat> so uh, I have a slightly different take, but, um, but that makes for good conversation. So <clears throat> certainly there are facts that are really hard to dispute, um, but at the same time, there are facts that are legitimately contested. We, we do live in a multicultural world. Um, so for me, a post-truth world is where there's really no effort uh, to publicly take these multiple perspectives and make sense of them as a public. And so the consequence is that <clears throat> that uh, you know, we rely on other things and facts no longer really are important. So, <clears throat> but you know what? I, I don't think this is very surprising at all that we live in a post-truth world. You know, where, where do we publicly go to take a look at facts and understand what they mean and, what, and how they make sense for us as a public? We don't have those public forum. You know, the closest thing we have is perhaps the news, but the news is really about opinions. You know, the, the line between news and opinion has really been blurred. And when they do talk about news, right, it's really about what one person's opinion in and whether they're logically consistent uh, and whether they conform to some kind of ideology. There's really no room at all to talk about facts and bring facts into the discussion. So what we're really modeling for people as this is the way that we talk about facts. We actually don't talk about facts. We talk about opinions. So where else would people go? You know, it's not surprising to me that you have this situation where people are not trained to be able to talk in these public fora uh, and learn how to talk with one another about how to make sense of facts. How do you put them together, the critical faculty? You know, we, we teach this to our students and we find they have difficulties to do them. How do we expect people uh, to do that on their own? Uh, so, you know, we, we need to be aware that we live in a very, very, uh, privileged place where we do this all the time. As President Johnson pointed out, you know, facts is what we live with and work with, uh, but that's not the case all the time. And the critical faculty is not always the case. Um, and, you know, it's also true that institutions don't know how to do this, right? In my area uh, of the world, uh, government, in particular administrative law, 
you know, governments do not want to talk about facts. They do not want to engage for a variety of reasons. And so what would you expect people to do when they want to talk about what's going on? Uh, they don't have that opportunity. And so consequently, we're all settled into our insular places where facts no longer are important. You don't have to justify, you don't have to explain yourself, right? And you can even go into, uh, you know, your own uh, uh, <clears throat> theories about uh, crazy theories about the way the world works. So, you know, my pitch is, is that <clears throat> Ohio State really could be that place, could be that play an important role and be a fora where people can gather to talk about facts. Now facts become important and we've developed the critical skills in being able to deal with that because right now we don't have a place to do that. Um, <clears throat> it also is an educational institute and we need to teach our students how to do this. Uh, we also have a world-class uh, research faculty that can bring substantive expertise on a problem. Um, and finally, we're, vi we're uh, viewed as a neutral place where I think many communities would trust in us uh, to try to be fair uh, and, uh, and neutral about how we go through this. So I think Ohio State could play a very important role in this. And my suggestion would be that we don't tackle very highly polarized topics because the goal here is to learn how to develop these skills, both within the institution and among citizens. And so I would suggest taking a policy that's important to people um, <clears throat> and working on that. And uh, <clears throat> you know, let's be clear, I'm not really talking about you know, interpreting charts and tables, right? Uh, that, that's not what I'm going at. I mean, emotion uh, is slightly disparaged here, but that's what people are feeling and that's the way that people think. And we need to address that. And so once people have a chance to talk about their problems, we can work through critically uh, how facts and how thinking through a problem can actually lead to action. So, uh, and finally, let me just say that I have a little different take. I, I, don't, I don't think truth is really the goal here, right? That's the role of science, right? If we have to wait for truth to make a public decision, we'll be around for a long time, right? In democratic institutions, all we care about is what we call intersubjective truth, namely, What's the best story we can tell right now about what the facts mean? Because we got to get on with business. We have to take action. So uh, <clears throat> those are some of my uh, perspectives and I'm looking forward to hear what, what uh, others have to say. Thank you. You know, it's, it's interesting. Thank you so much, David. Uh, Devon, it's interesting, um, you know, this idea of post-truth. I mean, the simple term of it implies that we are, we're after truth, that we've, we've gone beyond truth and there's something after that. But you know, in, the, in, in your pursuits and your research, I'm, I'm hoping that maybe that's not the case. What, can you tell us your perspective on this? Yeah, no, this is, um, um, this is a really great question. And I think it's um, something that's really hard to grapple with. As a sociologist in the room, I feel as if I'd, I'm carrying the, 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 the mantle of having to make sure we're putting all this sort of, con all of this post-truth idea into a proper historical context of thinking about kind of where we've come from. Right, then post-truth, that means, you know, 20 years, 20 or 30 years ago, it's, it, there's a sort of an implication that these things weren't such a problem. But I mean, fundamentally, I think there's always been a sort of contestation about kind of, kind of what is right, or, you know, we, we treat facts as if, they're, as if they're objectively and manifest, but that's often not the case, right? And, and, and information and truth or whatever, whatever that means is often refracted through really important institutions of power and control. Right, we historically think about this as the sort of distinction between science and religion as these two, and in this example, I'm treating them as mutually exclusive, but we think of them as sort of opposing forces that seek to explain the world around us. Um, and we think of that as changing now, when in reality, it's, it's not so much that it's that, that fundamental question of trying to figure out what is true is changing or that we're less likely to believe facts, but that the sort of institutions and in, in, in through which we're understanding our social world are changing. Right, we're now being um, everything. We're trying starting to understand things through things like Twitter, through social media. Um, that is now being the lens through which we're understanding whether or not um, President Trump said something um, or did did or did not say anything. Um, and I think that's the important thing to think about when it comes to post truth is that this is a common problem that we've had. The only thing that's relatively, in some sense, new in this example is the fact that um, the amount of um, claims to truth are much more easily accessible, right? We can access, act, we have access to a lot more folks' opinions about a lot more things in a way that in the past, that may have been um, not, as, not, as, not as easy to do. And as a result, we're also getting a lot more contestation about what is true. We're no longer having a sort of um, 
the, the president being able to use their bully pulpit and just be able to sort of spew information as if that is, you know, information from high. But reality, we're actually now having the ability to, you know, oh, such and such said something. Well, let me go ahead and check that. Let me go ahead and check and see if that's actually the case. Um, and I think, um, you know, David makes a really, a really great point about the sort of intersubjective inter truth and thinking about um, how, how we would in sociology think about this is think about this as, as a relational question of how do we um, work together to come to an understanding about what is happening in a particular instance. And I think the ability to do, to do that is increasingly difficult as a result of, you know, these technologies being increasingly the sort of um, uh, membrane through which we're understanding what's happening. No question. And, you know, it's interesting. I, I, I really resonated with what you said, David. In journalism, Bob Woodward has said, we seek the best obtainable version of the truth. And, um, you, you know, I'm, we have a, a great question that's come in here. And I want to do remind everyone that the question, uh, if we want to hear your questions, there's a Q&A button right at the bottom of your screen. So if you would click on that and put your question in there, we're already starting to get some terrific questions. Um, and one that goes along with kind of the second area that we were going to look at, um, the question we have is that post-truth sounds a lot like a second stage of truth. And so what was pre-truth and how did it shape post-truth? And, and I guess maybe that takes us to the history history of post-truth. I mean, this seems like it's a, a new um, experience for all of us, but I, I guess that's probably not true. Uh, David, maybe you could start with us. Okay, well, <clears throat> again, I, I, I look at post-truth as uh, something where we have a, uh, we're no longer interested in facts and what they mean, right? It's, it's all about emotion and, uh, you know, serving my particular interests in my particular bubble. And you know we got to get out of these bubbles, right? We we have to make sense of the world through facts. Uh, the difficulty is that uh, you know previous to this, we believed that there was sort of one way the world should look at things, and uh, that was the truth. And that's also dangerous, right? We don't want uh, people saying, "I have the truth, and this is what democracy should do." That's a very dangerous place to be. Uh, and so we've realized now that people do have multiple perspectives. This is democracy. Um, and so, you know, we need those multiple perspectives to be able to make sense of the truth. It's a working truth, right? It's, it's not really truth per se, it's inter, well, intersubjective, right? We, we agree for the sake of getting something done that this is the way the world is. We don't, and, and from that, we'd be able to act. But post-truth is not an extension of truth, right? It's just, uh, you know, uh, uh, it, it, it's really, there's no effort to try to get there. Right, we, we've moved beyond the importance of truth and facts as something important. Kelly, we had a really interesting conversation when we prepped for this. And um, it surprised me when you said that the illusion that social media kind of um, puts us in our own bubbles of information isn't, hasn't been panned out through research. So we have this perception that we have this self-affirming experience through our social media channels, but it sounds like that's not the case. How uh, are we, how so, is social kind of, and the, the whole online experience impacting our experience with post-truth? Yeah, okay, sure. So, so there are two very common narratives when you look at the media talking about these divisions in political beliefs, two common narratives used to explain it are one, there are echo chambers, or sometimes you hear them referred to as filter bubbles. This is the idea that everyone consumes their own unique constellation of media and there's very little overlap. So the reason people believe those crazy things that you know are wrong is that they've simply never encountered the evidence that leads you to have the right beliefs. Uh, the other mechanism that gets talked a lot about a lot in the media is the role of social media. So the thing that I would say here is that if we're going to be talking about the importance of evidence in identifying what we are going to call the truth. Obviously, this is not a capital T truth. This is what is the best available evidence? What is the, the best way we have of summarizing what we know today? So if we're going to do that, we have to start right here. And let's talk about what the evidence says about these two phenomena. So regarding e echo chambers and, and filter bubbles, scholars have been looking at this in relationship to the internet for a decade or more. And uh, the, at this point, the, the body of evidence is pretty extensive. We have evidence coming from surveys and experiments, but we also have observational data recording what people actually do online. And time and time again, we find that although people are predisposed to choose news that shows their ideas in a positive light, we don't have evidence that people are systematically screening out all other perspectives. 
Whether you're talking about browsing the web or searching for news, scanning social media, people encounter difference constantly. It's a regular theme. So people, I think it, it's, it feels unintuitive because you've probably seen some of those QAnon theories talked about in the papers and you say, well, that never shows up in my social media feed. Well, the fact is that some of this more extreme stuff doesn't happen very often. It doesn't get shared or seen by very many people. And the people who do see it, it's a very narrow segment. And those individuals are not isolated from the other narratives. They aren't isolated from other evidence. So the uh, President Trump's supporters who came out in force at the Capitol building and um, attempted to, to, well, attempted a coup in short, this is not because they'd never heard anyone say, you know, the election was legitimate, right? And it's not because they hadn't ever encountered any evidence supporting that. The fact is that they had a very complex set of explanations for why the evidence out there doesn't work. Uh, the last thing I would say about social media is that the, the body of evidence about its influence on political beliefs and political knowledge is more limited. We are relatively early in trying to understand this phenomena, but there are a few studies out there. And to date, the research does not suggest that people who use social media more have higher levels of misperception. To the contrary, the evidence suggests that social media is associated with higher levels of political awareness and uh, sort of a mixed bag in terms of whether people accept political misinformation more often or not. Some things they are persuaded by, but uh, lots of other places, they hold more accurate beliefs based on their use of social media. That is so interesting. Um, and Devon, maybe we could look, kind of take it slightly to the sociological side of things. We have a, a question that's, that's, I think, so important to all of us about kind of society's um, interactions with each other. And, and we have this inability to hear each other, it seems at this point. And I think one of the reasons why post-truth has become such a prominent um, you know, entity in all of our lives is that we don't listen or understand each other's opinions of what truth is. How do we, as a society, encourage that level of dialogue that we need in order to understand what is real and what is not? Yeah, I think this is a good question. And it sort of builds on kind of in sort of like what Kelly was talking about. I think we have to move away from, at least to a certain extent, move away from just thinking that what's wrong is that um, folks just don't have information, right? Or that they, or that they're just choosing to not see, you know, to not see something that's obvious to everyone else, right? Because because this gets us, you know, away from thinking that, well, the answer is we just need to get more people information. That's the reason they need more access to the right information. Um, but like, I mean, the, the history of politics is fundamentally even agreeing on the a, a, a statement and then but disagreeing about what Kelly said, the underlying causes and the processes that are that are sort of manifesting this. There's a really wonderful example in um, there was a, the 2012 presidential debates. Um, then Governor Mitt Romney or then form, former government Mitt Romney was was made a statement about this, the, the, the amount of um, um, ships that the Navy had at that time. And it said something to the effect of it's the lowest level since, you know, 1920 or, or you know, earlier, a much earlier period to, to which President Obama responds. He goes, well, yeah, that's, that's true, but that's because the capabilities we're using today are very different. We don't have battleships anymore. We have destroyers, we have aircraft carriers. So in that moment, they're really getting at a sort of they agree, yes, even when we agree on whether or not there are, you know, not a lot of ships in our Navy, the fact is that actually what explains and accounts for that, that the difference in actually what that means is, a, in this case, a, a difference of political opinion, um, but also a sort of a different under, understanding of the underlying aspect of what gives rise to this, to, this, um, to this fact, if you will. And I think we have to understand as we're engaging with our students as an institution of higher education, but also as we're engaging um, across the dinner table with family members that disagree with us, or engaging in just our own interpersonal relationships, that we have to, make, we have to understand where folks are coming from and recognizing that, um, um, you know, just because you think one thing does not mean that someone else is going to think the same thing, even if we agree on the same information, right? This is a, and I think um, uh, President Johnson mentioned the sort of COVID vaccine. Um, people are not going to take this vaccine. It's, it's, I mean, me and my family have these sorts of dis discussions often as far as, and in, in, in understanding why people are not going to take the vaccine, 
you have to understand why specific people have specific relationships with respect to the institutions that um, um, develop the vaccine, et cetera, right? When it comes to um, sort of black communities, there's a very specific relationship with respect to healthcare um, that, is, that is unique. And it requires more than a trial that tells us 100,000 people, you know, took this trial and, and it worked out and everything's great. No, there actually has to be a sort of compelling element to it to understand what is to, to sort of bridge the gap between why um, uh, you know, a black individual might feel a particular way about that. And I think the sort of, we get into a, a problem of patronizing people as if they're, as if they're, as if they're, that's as if they're ignorant or stupid or, or just or blind to what they see in front of us. And we have, I think when, we, when it comes to how we're thinking socially, uh, we must be um, aware and, and try and um, sort of actually address that fundamental, fundamental issue that people are coming to information with vastly different experiences with respect to information. Could I, <clears throat> could I uh, make a distinction here between uh, hearing other opinions uh, and, all, and getting facts to be able to adjudicate those opinions. So it might be the case that individuals hear and know about the arguments being made by someone else. The difficulty is how do they know who's telling the truth or what the facts are, right? And so do we have the capability, do we have the institutions that are able to handle that and provide that kind of information? So my <clears throat> area of study is really information policy and data governance. And I'm particularly concerned about how much government information there is, and so how little people actually have access to it. And so we, you know, we end up trading opinions, right? There's no access to information or facts to be able to say, you know, government workers get paid too much or they don't. It becomes just opinion. And so <clears throat> one interesting area is this thing called open data, which says government should just put its data out there on a website and people can download it crimes, uh, health statistics, and so they can begin to understand the nature of public problems. Now, the interesting thing, though, is that people put up this data, and now this facts become available, and now we realize that people don't have the tools or the skills to be able to make sense of the facts. So now second generation open data says, we have to teach people how to make sense of, the, of those facts using tools and, and ways to make sense of it. And so that means the tools, but it also means providing public forum where they can talk among themselves. Facts don't speak for themselves, right? People have to talk about it so that it has meaning for them. And so open data, which used to be just throwing some facts up on the, on the screen on a, on a web website, really have now been augmented by additional tools. And I think that's very uh, telling for how we should think about facts and how we resolve differences of opinion. I think people are frustrated by the talk shows where people just trade opinions. They don't have the facts to be able to choose among them. It's not a shortage of opinions and counter, uh, counter ideas. It's the ability to, to, make, you know, to, to say who's right and what are, what's the basis for your information. And to do that, we have to have facts. Tell us about facts, Kelly. Tell us about data and <laughs> how can we use these things to know what's real? So I, I think that uh, David's point is well taken. Having more evidence available is useful. But the second point that uh, more evidence is not in itself a solution to this problem helps illustrate how difficult this is to solve. And I'm gonna go a step further and say, the tools to help people understand are also not gonna be sufficient because in the end, every belief requires a leap of faith. No one, can evaluate every logical step, every piece of empirical evidence that leads to a conclusion. At some point, you have to put faith in the actions of others. And right now, we see deteriorating faith in any of the institutions required for the production of and the dissemination of these kinds of evidence and the kinds of knowledge claims that we depend on in order to make policy decisions, in order to make decisions as citizens about which policies we support. And so, while I applaud the efforts to provide more data, I think it's really important to remember that those efforts um, have been ongoing for a long time and they, in many cases, have not been as successful as we might have liked. Take, for example, the debate around climate change, right? Climate scientists, there's no question, right? Climate change is real, it's happening now, humans are responsible. And one of the ways that the climate scientists have responded to some of the questions about these claims is to make more and more data available. That has not, 
done much to uh, convince the skeptics, right? Because the skeptics may not have the training, but they do have data now, and they can use the data to try and make sense of this complex pattern. And um, we are very powerful cognitive processors. We can do a lot with information. And if you don't have the relevant training, but you do know where you're trying to get, it's very easy to be misled by the data and by the intuitions or biases that you may not realize that you have. I, I couldn't agree more. And I, I think that one of the, you know, we have such a challenge in that we also can't evolve, right? Like we can't be, we used to call things, we used to say global warming, right? And then that became a misnomer. And so no long, so people didn't believe it happened because it wasn't the planet getting warmer. Look, we have the ice outside. And so it can't be that it's getting warmer. And masks, you don't need to put a mask on because masks are not, oh, well, actually we changed, we, we have more science, but we can't seem to move with the science as it changes. And, and we've gotten several questions in, um, and Kelly, I'd love for you to start with this about kind of the source of our misinformation and the places that we're supposed to have faith. So think about the, the spaces we used to have trust in our government. We used to have trust in law enforcement. We used to have trust in our educators and, and all of these things. It, it, we used to have trust in journalists and I, I, it's a little stab in my heart as I say that. All of the things I've mentioned are now considered to be corrupted and, and are no longer providing us with the truth that we need. For, for a certain portion of the population. So when the, we can't trust our elected officials or the media or anyone else, how do we know who's telling us the truth? Okay, so th thanks, that's a really important question. I think it's actually two questions that you've raised there. Um, and one is, uh, I sort of set myself up for one, right? Because I took away the explanations that people rely on. I said, no, it's not echo chambers and it's not social media. It's not as simple as that. You can't just point at those. And so then everyone wants to know, well, wait, if it's not those things, what is the reason? And I think you started to give part of the answer to that question, Nicole, right? It has a lot to do with um, challenges to the authority of various institutions that have historically been trusted. But that's not the only thing that's going on. Another thing that we have pretty good evidence that um, affective polarization, that is the, the sense that the, your political opponents aren't just on the opposite side from you on the issues, but they're actually bad people. They have evil intent and they're out to do harm. That belief has grown steadily over the last several decades. And we have growing evidence that that belief is associated with uh, a propensity to accept false claims, especially false claims that are critical of the other side. And that's not surprising, right? If, if the other side is willing to lie and deceive in order to achieve their ends, then anytime you hear a claim that threatens what you believe, the most simple explanation for why someone might say such a thing is that they're liars. That's, I think, part of it. Part of it may have something to do with the complexity of the information environment, the range of uh, claims that are accessible. So claims that are only believed by 1% of the population, it used to be that something believed by 1%, well, that was just a few people. A few people in a, a community of 10,000 is not gonna make a big difference. But when those few people can come link up to a few people in another community, link up with a few people in another community, suddenly that 1% is 3 million people and it looks very different. And the consequences of having 3 million people who share fringe beliefs uh, that seem to be disconnected from empirical evidence are very different than the one person living in a community by themselves who holds those fringe beliefs. Devon, so, this seems like it's, oh, I'm sorry, David, please jump in. No, no I mean, uh, in public administration, uh, you know, Woodrow Wilson, uh, one of the famous writers who started American public administration starts off his essay that uh, the essential thing that government needs is trust, right? We do wanna make government accountable, um, but we don't want them in every single detail of what we do. And so there has to be some level of trust that we're do going to do our job, but there's still this accountability notion, right? And, and trust is fortified uh, when people ask, well, what is the basis for your decision, right? That's a, a central norm in American democracy. It's an essential norm in science. What is the basis of your decision? And so uh, one way to increase trust is to provide the facts and the logic 
by which you came to your decision. And, and I don't think that, uh, <clears throat> so trust is there, right? Trust can play an important role. I mean, we, we've learned that we just don't throw data out there because it doesn't make any sense to people. So what you need to do on these websites also is to have experts provide context so that it's understandable to understand where you know things are pretty strong in, in, in what the facts say, uh, but some things that are open for, we're not really quite sure yet. And that really invites the public in uh, to play their role in talking through and making sense of what public, what the problems are and how to go forward. So expertise and trust is very important, but accountability and transparency are also important. And, and I would venture to say that a lot of the problem is that we just don't know how to do this in a public way. That's the difficulty. And so if people don't have a way to do this and they feel uncomfortable and the only models that they've had uh, are opinion trading uh, and logical consistency, where do they get the skills to be able to understand facts? I think people can understand what climate uh, science has to say. Uh, it has to provide a lot of context. It has to be provided by expertise and they have to work through it in terms of dialogue. So uh, <clears throat> I, I, I would agree that trust is central, um, uh, but I'm not very, I'm very positive on the ability for people to understand this, you know, <clears throat> to be able to understand something like climate change, we have to explain it to them, right? I don't think we can go away so, you know, trust us, right? I, I think we do have to involve them because then that way they see what their role in climate science is, right? If they understand what climate change is about, they become more equipped, they have the agency to say, what can I do now uh, in my own individual world to advance uh, the problem of climate change. I totally hear what you're saying. Can I, can I jump in really quickly? Please. Yeah, so I mean, there's two things that I kind of want to, that, that Kelly said and David said that I think um, really tie, tie, tie nicely together. Um, you know, David asked, you know, what is the basis of your decision? And, and Kelly brought us to the thinking of the complexity of the information that we're facing. And I think increasingly, um, a lot of the, the, the post-truth that we think of right now, or the sort of alternative facts, um, I think does a disservice to the complexity of most decisions that we face, something like climate change and, and a variety of other social issues, um, such that, right, like we want, the, we want the very 140 character answer to a very complex question that is, is it's almost disrespectful to even think that a lot of our answers can be, can be answered in, in such sort of fashion. And often that plays out on public forums in ways that actually pre that pre precludes the actual getting actual answers. So when it so when you look, if um, sorry, um, the, there was a congressional testimony a couple of years ago where where Mark Zuckerberg from Facebook was on Capitol Hill, um, you know, being grilled as a lot of the the sort of posts would have you believe um, about questions and and things, and, and and the questions were primarily posed towards understanding whether or not Facebook does anything to to censor politicians, um, to fact check politicians, etc. And and you know. Politicians from the left, I mean, uh, Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez, Ayanna Presley, um, and, and folks from the right as well, asking questions that we want the answers to, right? The question was very put plainly, um, Facebook, do you um, police the things that politicians say? And um, uh, Mark Zuckerberg's response was, you know, sort of, and, and then, you know, the congressperson would respond, well, it's a yes or no question. And actually, that's not true, right? It's not a yes or no question. In cases in which you know we can we can assess whether or not um, President Joe Biden made a phone call during on this particular day, well, that we can check that. But whether or not we're we're you know getting into the sort of nitty gritty of a lot more complex social issues, well, then that's not something that I imagine Facebook has necessarily has the information capabilities to adjudicate, right? Um, uh, uh, Senator Bernie Sanders made a post on Instagram a couple, during the, pri the the Democratic primary that said something like, "If we cancel student debt." Um, that will reduce the racial wealth gap by over half. That's just not true. Um, and unfortunately, Senator Bernie Sanders took that post down, but there was the post initially, right? But in order for Facebook to, to be able, or Instagram or any of these companies to actually be able to think about that, we have, we have to recognize that the questions are not as simple as black and white, that there is actually requires, to, to, to David's point, to, to bring down data from an open data website, right? You got to have a sense of expertise in what you're looking at. And I think that a lot of the questions that are the more difficult questions, the ones that are not black and white, um, just are really difficult to, to sort of do in that way. Well, and I wanna transition um, to a similar piece and, and you, you've said a couple of times black and white and I think using that, applying that in another context, 
you know, truth takes different meaning depending on who's giving it to you. And you made a note earlier about diverse communities interpreting um, information differently and the past experience of those diverse communities are gonna allow them to receive truth in different ways depending on the context and the source. And so, you know, when you think of things like the COVID vaccine and, and other elements that are true life and death issues, what can we as an institution at, at Ohio State do, and this is a question we're getting from an audience member, um, in order to uh, provide the, the trust that people can have belief in us and, and can trust powerful institutions to tell them the truth? I, yeah, I think I think the first step is, is making, making the recognition that while, uh, <laughs> I'll speak crudely here, while, while white folk might have a particular allegiance and respect and appreciation and trust towards a lot of the institutions um, or to many institutions, that that is not necessarily the same in black communities from, from, what, from which I come from, right? Like to think, you mentioned trust in, in law enforcement. Well, I mean, there's been a long, a long history of distrust. I mean, you know, some of our sort of, um, sort of most um, valued um, leaders in our community, I'm thinking of Fred Hampton, whose movie's coming out very soon, was assassinated by the police, mm -hmm. like in, in no unclear terms. So I think that we have to first recognize that there is this difference in, in relationship to the institutions that we are supposed to trust. And I think as an institution of higher education, we have to understand that not just um, our, the sort of wide variety of students that we engage with, um, but that the ideas in themselves come from and, can, and will be interpreted in different ways. And we have to be, we have to be sensitive to that. Right, we can't. Um, you, you can't just, you know, believe that one person, one person's theory is is the sort of silver bullet. There has to be a, a much broader respect for um, for points of view. Um, to, to use a philosophical term, there must be broad, broader respect for different epistemologies, a way of thinking and understanding the world. Um, that that right now we don't do that well. So with respect with respect to the COVID vaccine, um, it's important that. Um, um, healthcare professionals and, and, and epidemiologists or, or whoever the folks that do vaccine things, um, you know, need to need to be vaccine, yeah, whatever the, whatever the <laughs> term would be. Um, they need to actually be engaging with these communities, right? Talking to them about why they're, they have a particular reticence about, you know, in this case, taking a vaccine, but in other cases, trusting, trusting police or, or being, you know, distrustful of the government in general. Absolutely. You know, Kelly, I, I keep coming back to, and, and our audience is coming back to social media. I have quite a few questions about social media kind of adding to our burden and our challenge. And, you know, our pathway is to get um, universal quality, I put in quotes, quality information used to be the media. And we had a great deal of trust in, in that which we read and that what we saw. We, there's not nearly that degree of trust. And as many of you pointed out, it, it's just driven, it, you know, we have this polarization of opinion now. So people aren't sure what's actual news and what's punditry and what's opinion. And so, you know, when people are relying so much on social media as their pipeline to get information, and that can be um, masked to, to appear to come from experts, even though it doesn't, it can be skewed in a multitude of directions. How can people utilize the pathways for information that we have available to them in a meaningful way to make them educated in the spaces that they need education? Yeah, so um, before I answer that question, I want to just make one quick response to Devon and, and actually give a shout out to the folks over in the Ohio State University's public health College of Public Health, because they've been doing exactly what you're talking about, right? The folks who are thinking about how to encourage communities that are being hardest hit, the minority communities being hardest hit by COVID-19 to engage and take the vaccine is by going out and talking to these communities and trying to understand why, where is this aversion coming from? Where are your, your fears grounded? And let's try and understand. So, you know, there are really smart people who are really dedicated to this cause who are thinking about these issues in the ways that we are talking about uh, wanting them to do it. So, and that sort of optimistic note is how I want to begin to answer Nicole's question about, well, what, what do we do here? And I think the answer, another part of the answer, as Devon said, it's not, there's no silver bullet, right? Another part of the answer is that we build on the successes we already have. So I sympathize with everyone who feels frustrated that um, so many people believe the QAnon conspiracy theories or the COVID conspiracy theories, or you name it. There are a lot of false beliefs, uh, beliefs and falsehoods out there that are that are hard to accept that people think that they're real and hard to accept that you can't just get them to change their mind by putting something in front of them saying, see, here's the proof. 
So I, I get it. But also remember, belief in QAnon has been dropping steadily. Between October and January, Republicans' belief in QAnon dropped by 15 points, probably in large part because QAnon predicted that, that we would have a second term under the Trump administration, and we didn't. And that led people to update their beliefs. Not everyone, right? You're like, well, what about those 25%? Yeah, that's a hard, challenging problem. But the fact is people do update their beliefs. Um, climate change beliefs have become more accurate over the past several decades after taking a big hit following the actions of a group of political <laughs> elites, basically Republicans back in the late 90s, early 2000s, en masse started raising questions about the legitimacy of claims about climate change. And unsurprisingly, people who were identified as Republicans began to accept, well, there are these smart people who are on my side and they're asking questions. And so maybe I should be too. But we've seen a steady rebuilding of confidence in the climate science. So part of it is to not lose hope, not lose track of the fact that the majority of Americans do hold accurate beliefs. Like the, these things that are really troubling are still a minority, which ties into a part of the solution, right? Part of the way that we move past this, that we build confidence in the kinds of evidence that are out there, in the kinds of experts and institutions that people need to trust, is through the power of groups, right? Our social identities, the groups that we belong to powerfully influence who we believe, who we trust, what we believe. And so by speaking up when we see or hear someone say something that's not true, by engaging them respectfully and trying to have a conversation organized around evidence, and I don't mean, come on, what are you thinking? You must be stupid, like they have it, no. By trying to hear their point of view, trying to acknowledge often the, the, the fears that people have that lead to the beliefs that are inaccurate, uh, the fears are grounded in reality, right? They are living, in, they're, they're vulnerable, they have experienced things that are dangerous in the past. It's not that they, people are uh, being purely irrational, it's that it's a really complicated space. And so being respectful, bringing evidence to bear in, and, and taking on conversations with people who you might disagree with can be very useful. And lastly, back to this point of social media, like social media, one of the ways the, the big social media companies are trying to deal with this is by um, in some ways nudging those kinds of conversations, right? The, these companies have done research and they know that when someone speaks up, when someone shares a Snope and says, you know what, Snope says that's not true, conversation on the topic drops off rapidly. And often the people who originally posted the message will retract them. Not everyone. So you, you will always find the crazies who won't be convinced by anything you say. That doesn't mean you shouldn't say it because there are still a lot of other people who really are trying their best to be accurate and honest. So if you engage with them, the more people who understand and, and, and work within the, the uh, constraints that empirical evidence places on us, the more others will be persuaded that, okay, there's, there's safety in this. This is actually a reasonable choice. So, I just, I, I wanna just segue to you and I absolutely want you to jump in on this, but one thing, and we, uh, we're only, we down to about 12 minutes if you can believe it. Um, and I, I'm so aware of kind of our mission here is to think about what we can do as an institution to help move this forward. And I think if we can even think at it, you know, at the different levels. So from the K-12 level up through the collegiate level and beyond, what can we do in order to move forward the, the quest for actual truth and not post-truth? David, so, I'll turn that to you. <laughs> uh, so I think I already made my pitch. <laughs> you know, I, I'm not really familiar with K through 12. Um, you know, I think it's, uh, you know, the popular lay people know that, uh, you know, we really have to start thinking about teaching critical uh, thinking skills. But, you know, my, my discussion about open data, we realize there's a lot of things that have to go into being able to do that. This is not just providing facts, right? It's not just listening to experts, right? Uh, there's a lot of things that have to go into creating the skills uh, where, you know, we're no longer talking about politics. And the only way we talk about politics is because we're hot and emotional. No, this is a skill that we have to learn how to develop. 
And, and I think the university is well positioned. In fact, it's responsibility to teach how to do these skills. Um, yeah. So I, I think I've already made my pitch for, you know, an institution like Ohio State or, or any kind of uh, uh, institution where education, uh, research, uh, and facilitation and uh, is part of their, their part of their mission. I mean, we do have a question though about like evidence-based strategies that we can use for teaching people the skills to move away from this level of deep polarization. And, and you know, maybe you, all of you can help us understand, you know, this feels like such, not a new concept, but one that's become so deeply entrenched in who we are as a nation. And I'm not sure if that's got historical foundations to it, or if this is, if this really is something that has has risen up in the last, you know, I don't want to say last four years, but let's say the last eight years or 12 years. Um, and so, if we're thinking about this question of how we can teach people to better consume information, to to recognize how deeply polarized we've become, what what resources can we provide them? And and maybe Devon, you can start us, and Kelly. Yeah, I mean, I guess I'm not. I mean, I, I will say I'm not, you know, too sure on the sort of um, empirical literature that talks about the sort of different pedagogical techniques that are, you know, you know best applied to reduce polarization. Um, but I do think um, some of the conversations that we sort of we've, we've had to this point, um, at least thinking about interpersonal and, and instructional is being empathetic and, 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 and humble in what we're talking about as instructors. Um, I teach an urban social problems class here in, in the sociology department and every slide I, I sort of, or every, every class I give a sort of, a, we have a five pillars that sort of supports the approach of what I'm thinking about um, delivering, delivering the instruction. And one of those is, is recognition of limitations. And I think that being honest about what we do and don't know um, is important. Now I get this, I get this, this idea from recognition of limitations from Du Bois who has fantastic empirical work and even in that work, he says, I've done the best that I can. And there's, there's, there's elements of this that are likely out of my control. And here are these elements. Um, but the rest of this, you know, I've, I've put good faith in this. And I think as instructors um, in the classroom, that that's something that we have to do is recognize that, or at least be open about, well, you know what, we don't know this thing, or this thing is not settled. Um, and, and, and so often, I think in, in sort of broader public conversations, you know, everything seems to be settled as if my entire life, and, and I'm sure Kelly and David and, and Nicole, you as well agree with this, that you go to a, you go to a conference, I, I, just, just disagreement everywhere. I can't, I mean, there's disagreement about how I measure it. It's everywhere, everywhere there's disagreement. And I think um, bringing that kind of rigor that is in, embedded in our sort of academic work as researchers into our, our work as educators, I think is, will go a long way now, whether or not that's, um, whether or not that's founded on a sort of an empirical, you know, average of, of people doing this kind of idea. I don't, I'm, I'm not sure, um, but I think that it's certainly a, um, um, rhetorically anyway, a, a great strategy to, to, to move forward with. Absolutely. Kelly? So I would say that the classroom is such a, a powerful tool for educating about these issues. And it is in part because of the things that Devon is talking about, but, but also because I think it provides uh, an excellent opportunity to model the very kinds of conversations that we're talking about, right? We don't need um, to be the experts dictating the truth, right? We, we can have conversations with our students. We can help them to learn how to navigate information. We can model not only a humility in saying, well, this is something that we don't yet have the answer on. We can also model the, the fact that we all have to take the expertise of others into consideration, right? When I'm making a decision about what I believe about climate change, that decision is, well, first of all, as I said before, it's a leap of faith. I don't understand the climate science well enough to say the, to, to, to talk about it at the level of sophistication that a climate scientist does. And so it's incumbent on me to understand who holds the expertise. How do I assess the expertise? That's something I can do. But it's also, I think, very useful for us to say, and this is one of those places where I am deferring to the expertise of another. Right? Um, more speculatively, I think we, we have to be a little bit careful around this notion of critical thinking because critical thinking is a very powerful tool, but it is also one that can be abused. Right? Critical thinking can become a way, a bludgeon that you can use to beat down any claim of expertise and say, well, but you know, think about where the money's coming from. All you academics are all counting on your federal funds and thus you're promoting falsehoods in order to keep getting money, right? 
there's it, it's a very complicated idea and I'm afraid that it is sometimes engaged in too superficially and we have to be careful about engaging with it in more depth. The last thing I would say, and this is just simple mechanics that we know if you are trying to encourage kids in a classroom to get better at this, well, heck, if you're trying to encourage anyone to get better at sorting truth and fiction, you encourage them to read widely rather than trying to read deeply. When we ask people to read deeply and determine if a story is true or not by that very careful read of a single document, experts and novices alike are very bad at that task. But if you encourage people to read across a variety of sources and look for patterns, where are the consistencies and where are the inconsistencies, and begin to think about how those two things reflect on what the truth might be and where those might be reflecting on biases, we see that people do much better at being able to discriminate between truths and falsehoods. Absolutely. So maybe picking up uh, Kelly's point about we have to look at the positives, you know, in my area, administrative law, <clears throat> we have we can point to, to situations which could be highly polarized. For example, in Ohio, we use this thing called negotiated rulemaking. And if you recall all of these animal farms where you had hundreds of swine uh, that were thousands, tens of thousands uh, of animals packed into a, you know, one small facility, you could well imagine that PETA people would have significant problems with these factory farms. And yet they have a, you know, th these are an important part of the economy in many rural areas. So it's, you know, it's ripe for a really contentious debate. But through the negotiated rulemaking process, instead of the agency issuing a rule and then the various parties contesting it, what they do is they bring those parties in the room to agree and negotiate a settlement. And it worked. You know, it, it did work. It took a long time to do that. But the benefit of it in the real long term is that you don't have any challenges to these rules. Why? Because all of the parties have an interest and a stake in that outcome. They were part of the solution. So it is very possible to use some of these other techniques to deal with what could be very polarizing, very contentious issues um, and use something like negotiated rulemaking. We take pieces of this, we take pieces of that, and uh, you know we fashion these institutions in such a way that you know it meets the needs that we have at, at the moment. I completely hear you. Well, we have time for one last question. I'm going to ask it of each of you, and we have about 45 seconds to respond. But if you could be as specific as possible to help our audience as they leave this event, for those people who are seeking to understand authentic truth outside of the academy, where should they go? Kelly, would you start us? Well, I, I think I'll just follow up on the thing I've already said, right? It, it, there is no one source. Don't go looking for the, the fount of truth, right? Instead, look at the, a variety of sources, a variety of people talking about these topics, try and understand their, where they're coming from, what their biases might be, um, try and triangulate. Um, and I, I caution people in, in an era where conspiracy theories have gained more mainstream attention than in the past, be very careful about beliefs that are that hinge on complex webs of actors working in cooperative ways in secret. Like this is so hard to pull off. Um, and, and although once in a while a conspiracy theory is true, the vast majority of conspiracy theories are wrong because they're simply impossible to execute as theorized. I hear you. Devon, would you? Yeah, before I answer, I did want to just make two, two points about um, the sort of things we could do for K-12 education. We mostly talked about individual things, but I do want to reinforce the institutional aspect as well, um, right? We, there is an important a role of activism um, in, in, pushing for, um, in pushing for transparency and pushing for accountability that I think um, we've seen last summer um, with, with the uprisings happening across the country, that that, that work is also really fundamental to to and important to what's going on and understanding this 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 this, this point on, on post truth. And also as an as an institution of higher, of higher learning, I think um, Kelly's point on reading widely, I think is a, is another sort of um, um, uh, sort of feather in the cap of liberal arts education. The importance of Right, what are our GEC requirements that, that our undergraduate students are required to take um, to do just that, to read widely and be exposed to, to, to other modes of thought and other disciplines. So I think that's, I just want to say that that's really important. Um, but as far as what an individual can take 
from this as far as in, in sort of implement in their in their daily life i think the a lot of the, the stuff we've, we've mentioned to this point as well but also as far as news goes news sources that that, that folk should should um should, should think about as I've, I've i've come to learn that that recently i haven't really been able to get any any good news from the u.s so i go and see what our our friends across the pond in, in the uk and france um as, as well as um organizations like al jazeera um as providing news sources just because i mean you know, with the whole um, uh, Congresswoman Green thing over the last couple of weeks, um, I you, you would completely miss that there was a that there was a coup in Burma. So I think that um, that reaching out to these sort of international sources, getting getting that different perspective, um, and, and and how folks and how folks from outside the U.S. look at the U.S. and sort of laugh in in, in particular ways, I think is I think is a useful a useful step that we can all take. Um, but it's definitely one that I that I cherish. Thank you. All right, we got about thirty seconds, David. Can you? offer some good advice for people to... Well, you're asking, can you point to an institution, you know, and the, the old standby is the, the local town hall. Um, obviously, we can't cre recreate it, but we can look at the factors that why those are successful. And it's because there's trust among the people and there's a sincere desire to exchange and talk about the problems. And so if you could recreate those kinds of situations in, in institutions, uh, that would be my, my choice. Well, gentlemen, I am, thank you so much for your time, for your insights. I wish that we were in person so that you could uh, hear the applause that I'm sure is coming your way. But uh, just such a privilege to spend this evening with you. And I know this is just the beginning of our conversations, um, hopefully around this topic, because we have much more to dig into um, in order to really understand the ramifications and how to get through this really challenging time. Um, we are going to, this is certainly not the last event that we're going to have of this type. And so, we have another event for you that we very much hope that you will join us for next Thursday, February 11th, Restoring Faith in American Democracy. Uh, this will uh, no doubt be another extraordinary conversation in the Education for Citizenship series. Please, a reminder that these, uh, all the events that we've been holding are posted on the Education for Citizenship website in the events section. Um, and we very much hope that you will go and, uh, and see the ones that have already taken place be part of this conversation, which is going to look at public confidence in American democracy, which is, of course, at an all-time low, and citizens across the, the political spectrum are dissatisfied with democratic cornerstones, such as the fairness of the electoral process. And so this conversation is going to look at the causes of this loss of faith and to explore ways that the confidence in American de democratic system can be rebuilt. Uh, thank you all for being here. This is such a privilege to have shared this evening with you, and I wish you all to stay safe and uh, just be well. Thank you.